Good morning. God bless you. We met with Dr. King in 1966. We began Operation Red Basket on Saturday mornings in Pushed and Rainbow Pushed. For 54 years, we met every Saturday. Now we'll meet next year as a live audience because of the coronavirus crisis. We defend, we protect, we gain civil rights, we defend the poor. We said the country, we fight all the time, but yet we do not really know the science of the coronavirus. We encourage people, wherever you are, don't get in great numbers because this virus is a killer. We face coronavirus, they will let break your spirit. We'll keep meeting, we'll talk by internet, we'll talk by television. We'll keep meeting every Saturday morning by television, but not in live audience because of the danger involved. Reduce the risk and increase the output. You keep your hope alive and let nothing break your spirit. See you next Saturday on television. God bless you. I'm Todd Yeary, Vice President of the Rainbow Push Coalition, an international human rights organization working for equality and justice for all. On August 28, 1963, over a quarter million people convened in the shadows of the Lincoln Memorial to raise a righteous demand for jobs and freedom. The March on Washington reminds us that economic liberation and political empowerment are the critical ingredients of a just society. Every community deserves constitutional policing, opportunities for economic self-sufficiency, and sustainable and viable housing. The demand for jobs and freedom continues. We will sign up, speak up, and rise up on Election Day to register to vote, to verify your voter registration, and to get essential information about the upcoming elections, go to vote.org. Remember to line up because voting matters. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Operation Push Saturday Morning Forum of the Rainbow Push Coalition, coming to you from 930's 50th Street, our international headquarters. We're so pleased to be with you today, and we're praying for your continued health and strength as all of us cope with the coronavirus. It's a crisis set prayerfully, and uh, in terms of action, we will get through. Everybody, today we are changing formats, but we're not changing our mission and our vision. We are talking about the issues that matter most to you. We're bringing people from the church. We're bringing people from the civil rights community, from the business community, from the political community. Everyone who needs to speak to you about the issues that matter most to you. We are thankful to our Impact Television Network family, the largest African-American-owned television network, religious network in the country. And we are thankful to our iHeart Media family, WVON, Real Talk 910, and Patriot AM 1150. We thank you for your support. And for those of you who are on social media, please go to Facebook, the Facebook page of Rainbow Push, and like and share. Like and share. Create some watch parties, some movement watch parties, everybody. And we're streaming live to you on rainbowpush.org. I know it's a mouthful, but I had to get all of that house cleaning out the way. And throughout the week, Monday through Friday, call us at 773-FREEDOM, 773-FREEDOM. We're not here on Saturdays right now as we cope with the coronavirus, but we're here with you always. So come to 930's 50th Street and call us at 773-FREEDOM. So let us begin. The importance of this year's elections. Indeed, the University of Florida has just released a study that shows that more people will be participating in this election than have participated in a presidential election in the United States in more than 100 years. We're expecting between 180 million and 190 million Americans to vote. The 240 million who registered to vote. It's an extremely high number of people. But what will they be voting for? Why will they be voting? And even though they're projected to vote, will they vote if the coronavirus is still at play? There's so much that we've got to talk about. So, of course, first things first, we have our founder and president, the iconic Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., Thank you, Ms. Santita. <laughs> and we have the national spokesman for the Rainbow Push Coalition, Thank Jonathan you. Jackson. I think I know you. <laughs> and we have got Dr. Damon Arnold, one of the nation's foremost public health experts. Indeed, he was the former, he's the former head of the Illinois Department of Public Health. And we've got, indeed, uh, Pastor Vicki Johnson, uh, the pastor of the St. Thomas Lutheran Church, who's also one of the greatest singers you've ever heard. So thank Reverend Jackson, you would you like to, well, thank you. Thank you for the gift that you, you came out of the Push Choir. That's right. Many, many years ago. Reverend, Reverend Jackson. The stakes are high. Describe those stakes, Jonathan. 
for this year's election, number one, I would say, is the Supreme Court, that um, President Donald Trump has appointed more persons to the appellate court than any other president since George Washington. Uh, there are two, potentially three, Supreme Court justices that could be appointed by the next president of the United States. This is a year of the census and redistricting uh, will, take place, will take place and then the uh, reallocation of the congressional seats. So there's a lot of demographics that are gonna be put into balance, which is gonna shape the next decade and the appellate courts and the Supreme Court will affect the next 25 to 50 years. This is the highest stake as the Supreme Court. Yes. Dr. Uh, yes. You know, uh, one of the things, Reverend Jackson, is that we talk about the coronavirus and all that and how much of a threat it is, but without the vote, there's a deadlier threat than actually the coronavirus right now in this country, and that is for people to sit home and not to vote. Uh, those, those people we put in the selected offices actually are the ones that you've been fighting against for decades as far as equal rights, as far as access to education, to health. We have people dying in this country every day from other things that you've been fighting for all the time. So the coronavirus is part of the picture, but that vote, get out and vote. Because it says that this health system that lay on coronavirus is a factor. Yes. Uh, well, the coronavirus right now is something that we have to w watch out for. You know, high touch surfaces like screens, uh, doorknobs, uh, things that we walk with and, you know, handrails on stairs. But if you use the hand sanitizer and then you go in and cast your vote, keep that sanitizer with you and use it after you get out of there and go and wash your hands. But you vote early. You can avoid the crowds and make sure you go and vote. That is going to do more for this country than just sitting back and worrying about the virus. Let me ask you, uh, Pastor Johnson, what should the church's response be at this time? A lot of people are feeling, well, very anxious. And some people are filled with hope and other people are hopeless. What should the church's response be at this time when now we're seeing churches cancel services or at least postpone services because, and it's hard to gather, what do you say to people who say, well, maybe I won't vote, or it might be too much of a hassle, or I'm too scared to go vote today because of the coronavirus? Well, we must say to them, uh, and with very great assurity that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That sound mind is to listen to the medical professionals that are telling us exactly what to do with the hand sanitizer, hand washing. But we have to get out and vote. We cannot allow fear to overtake us. Our faith must guide us into the polls and make it go into action. Do you think it's, it's appropriate for the church to be involved in this process? Oh, most definitely. As we look back uh, through the civil rights history, um, we see that it was the church that took the forefront in the fight for justice and for freedom. And so, yes, the church must continue to be that voice that speaks out very clearly and loudly to go and vote. It's your right. So, yeah, that's why churches were burned and ministers were lynched. Front line, Jonathan. Well, and I wanted to ask you, Reverend Jackson and Jonathan, about California. And I bring up California and this primary in 2020 because it took, it's been more than a week and we have three quarters of the votes finally counted. Now they've finally said, you know, okay, Bernie Sanders is the winner. Does it, do you think that this was a healthy process because people could actually vote by mail up until election day, um, absentee ballots, people had more of an opportunity to vote or do you think that Senator Sanders lost some momentum because they were not able to call the race earlier? Sure, he lost momentum by them not calling the, the, the uh, race earlier, but 
all of a sudden, uh, they've had the thumb on the scale going against Senator Sanders, and I think that's pretty obvious to anyone that would look at this objectively. In Iowa, he received the most votes but did not receive the most delegates. However you get to justifying it, it's wrong. The person that wins the most votes should win the most delegates. So they did not announce him to be the, the uh, winner in Iowa. In New Hampshire, then they were saying, oh, somebody else is coming up, Bloomberg's coming into the race, and they let all that money become a distraction for a rich guy that can pick up his ball, pick up his tent, gather up a collection of former elected officials that are African-American, uh, pay them for the next 10 months, and then never take their call again. Okay, but that's a rich privilege that some people have. Then going into Nevada, they've never projected him as the winner. They've constantly had their thumb. And then a week after Super Tuesday, uh, the crown jewel of the uh, American electorate is California. California may have close to 50 Congress people, uh, congressional people in, in California, uh, over 40 million people that are documented only heaven knows how many people are in California, that he is the winner of the crown jewel of all the states, and the party is announcing it a week later. So I think we're beginning to see some of the stress on the system, some of the flaws in it. These are privately held companies that have no oversight, that can't get an app right, that can't count people's vote. You they say the Democratic and Republican parties. I don't think most people know that. Please explain. Right. So when there were votes that weren't, when votes weren't counted and, uh, or, or miscounted or undercounted uh, in Iowa, what's the paper trail? Is there any state oversight? Is there any federal oversight? We didn't see the leadership of the DNC coming forward to speak. So, yeah, that's what I would say. That process has been crooked. That's a thumb on the scale, if you would ask me. And uh, who's going to hold, hold themselves responsible? The chair of the DNC didn't come forward. I mean, sending two white primaries out of New Hampshire. If South Carolina were in the front, Booker and Candler should have been in the race. We deserve to be on the front side, not, not the white primary. That's a century ago. You're a veteran, yeah. Dr. Arnold. Um, how do you feel when you see the thumbs on the scale during, the, during an election? How do you feel? How does it make you feel? when we're seeing people wait in line up to seven hours. You know, is that a form of voter suppression to you? When, yeah, to me, it's an, it's an abridgment of the guarantee that the um, country and the Constitution gives to every citizen to have the right to vote. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've seen people die in the battlefield. You know, I was in Iraq and did two tours there. And uh, for those people to die in vain, uh, for it to come back to this country and have veterans treat it the way they are sometimes uh, is really an abridgment to me. Uh, but the right to vote is essential, and that is something that those people were fighting for the freedom to do that. Uh, as a veteran, I can't set the moral compass of the country. The only thing that veterans do is secure the rallying points for public debate and discussion so that you can actually come to the conclusion and set the moral compass for the country. We don't do that. That's not our role. It's the role of the people to set the moral compass. And in order for them to set the moral compass, it's a fundamental right to vote and to elect the people that they feel will help them guide that compass. What do you get with the, the, the firewall and say, Biden? What does the firewall get? Explain, Reverend. Well, if you're two cents tax on the wealth as Americans, Fifty million dollars of HBCUs. Constitution right to vote. Black woman on the ticket and on the Supreme Court. Things that matter, obstruction, not just who got a job. Are you heartened by the fact that, and I would like to bring you into this, Pastor Johnson, as well, Medicare for all. It seems to me that the conversation has changed. Now, this is not some outlier conversation. I mean, 50% of the bankruptcies in this country are driven by medical bills. We had a woman in New York who had strep throat. And um, what happened to her? She had a $28,000 bill because you took the culture out of network, right? Is that what we're voting for as well? I mean, what are some of the issues that you think are really on the table, aside from the Supreme Court. What are the issues that are on the table? I mean, when you're speaking to people tonight, today and tonight, what, what are they voting for? For people who say, you know, because you still have people who say, I don't need to vote. Well, 
health care is certainly one of the issues that we are voting for, we are addressing. Everybody needs health care. I don't care how healthy you are at some point, if it's just preventive med medicine, you need health care. So we're voting for health care. We're voting for the retirement rights of the elderly. We're voting for students, to uh, their student loans uh, being taken away from them. We're voting for um, financing for education. We There are so many things that we have to vote for, and yes, we must vote early to avoid anything that would hinder us from casting our votes. Like going into, and we urge you to call 1-866-OUR-VOTE, 1-866-OUR-VOTE, because 34 million Americans were purged from the voter rolls between 2014 and 2018. So when we come back, we're going to be talking about some of the key races, the key races throughout the United States. Um, you hear, you heard Jonathan Jackson say that we are voting on not just the Supreme Court, but the appellate courts. These people have the power to uh, really dictate how we live. That's being set right now. So if you didn't think that traffic, well, now that's important. <laughs> That's right. Well, now I wouldn't know about that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but all of that's important. And of course, health care and, um, and how we worship and where we worship, you know, because we have so much that is on the table right now. And we want you to continue to like and share on Facebook, on the Reverend Jesse Jackson Senior page, and on the Rainbow Push page. We're streaming live on rainbowpush.org. Call us at 773 Freedom throughout the week. Stay right there on the Impact Network on the Saturday morning forum, the Operation Push Saturday morning forum of the Rainbow Push Coalition. Back in a moment. Cook County Jail is now an official polling place. For the very first time, detainees awaiting trial cast their early ballots. This moment is history making. For the first time ever, inmates awaiting trial are voting while behind bars. Cook County Jail becoming an official polling place. That was good to know that, you know, I have some type of voice in, in what's going on and what affects me. Reverend Jesse Jackson has been fighting for the cause for years. Together with Sheriff Tom Dart and Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, over 500 inmates cast their early vote. We are making sure that county jails have a process for voting. Every county jail throughout the state will also make vote by mail available to everyone who is being detained pretrial. Every jail building that houses inmates here on the southwest side has machines and election judges. Professors from local colleges and universities even volunteered their time to break down the candidates and their platforms. We can make a change in life, that our vote what matters, that we have the chance to vote for the people that we think that's going to benefit us and benefit others. Reverend Jackson hopes giving pre-trial detainees the right to vote here in our state will also cause an impact to other states. Thank uh, Lieutenant Governor Stratton for her leadership on this because it's not just Chicago, it's, it's East St. Louis, it's, that, it's the whole state. Across the South, they use voting, locking people up as a way of taking people off of the rolls. Uh, in the South, the numbers of, of pre-trial detainees are so great until it determines the election of governors. And those, those kind of numbers in jail, we intend to break it up and set a new pace for the country. We are sanctuary. sanctuary. We are a sanctuary. When I think of Rainbow Push, I think of two words, social justice. Education advocacy. Political empowerment. Freedom and equality. Corporate partnership. Stop the violence. Save the children. No. Change. Inclusion, evolution, progress, justice. Jesse Jackson. Keep hope, keep hope alive. alive. Keep hope, keep hope alive. alive. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. Somebody. I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody.
Good morning. We are in the midst of a major drive to get more members, more people engaged and involved in Rainbow Push, uh, supporting the programs of Push for Excellence and the Citizenship Education Fund. If you're interested in public policy and you want to help change the policies that impact those incarcerated, change the policies that impact uh, students attending uh, colleges and universities, if you want to be a policymaker, then you need to join Rainbow Push and join by paying your $35 right now. Some of you watch us every week. You, you listen to us on the radio. You're viewing us on social media. We need you to become a member. It's only $35 a year. If you believe in the scholarships that we give to thousands of students each and every year, we've awarded more than $10 million to scholars year to date. What do you have to do to give and support PUSH? It's really very simple. You can go to rainbowpush.org if you're on a computer and press donate. Give any amount, every dollar is important. If you want to talk to somebody, call us at 773-256-2775. You can give right now, any denomination that you uh, choose. You can text the word PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444. Text the word on your cell phone. Most of you have a cell phone. Just text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444, and you can give any amount that you feel comfortable giving or call us 773-256-2775 or go to rainbowpush.org and just press donate. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Operation Push, Saturday morning forum of the Rainbow Push Coalition, coming to you from our international headquarters at 930's 50th Street here in Chicago. Call us throughout the week at 773-FREEDOM. As we are making adjustments to the coronavirus crisis, we are not going to be meeting here on Saturdays, but we are always here at 930's 50th Street, so call us at 773-FREEDOM throughout the week, Monday through Friday, and... If you are on social media right now, please go to Facebook, to the Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. page, and to the Rainbow Push page, and like and share, like and share, create some watch parties, and stream us live on rainbowpush.org, and leave us your comments. We want to hear from you. We need to interact with you. Uh, we're talking uh, now about something really, really interesting. As we are in election 2020, expecting more than 190 million people to participate in the fall, more than we have seen in more than 100 years. What we want to find out is what are the, what's happening on, this, on the city, county, state, and federal levels. We have got exciting campaigns. And um, did you know that Mitch McConnell, for example, the majority leader in the Senate, Jonathan, has a 37% approval rating. Someone is running against him. She's got a real shot. We've got Mike Espy, who just won the primary in Mississippi. We've got Jamie Harrison. These could be governors, I mean, excuse me, these could be senators coming out of the deep south. Is that significant? That's extremely significant. And at the same time, we also have an African-American mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, that showed up at his polling place and uh, of 11 years, and they did not have him on the rolls. So I think we have to balance that with the uh, machine that's in place for voter suppression. What's happened in Dallas and Houston in the southwest uh, part of Texas and persons that have been uh, already taken off of their voter rolls. It was 17 million, I believe, just in the last four years. Uh, people oftentimes missed what President Trump was saying when he says, my crowd is bigger uh, than Obama's, my crowd is bigger than Obama's. That's not what he meant. What he was saying was Hillary Clinton won by three million votes, popular votes. We have 22 uh, governors that have complete control of the executive, judicial, legislative branches engage in voter suppression. It's more of them than us engage in voter suppression. And true enough, they have continued to, that was a dog whistle to those that were in that legislature to take our numbers down. And our numbers have been off in Texas and in California, and uh, there are also a spike even in South Carolina. Rev, they talk about the firewall. 
that there were 368,000 roughly Democratic votes cast in 2016. This year was around 530,000 votes cast in the Democratic primary in South Carolina. Put a note that the President of the United States was there the day before the Democratic primary because it's an open primary, encouraging Republicans to vote for Democrats. So we don't know really how many Republicans are even voting in select states that are open, meaning you don't have to declare your party affiliation to be a part of that. Um, voter suppression, I think we have to be mind mindful of. And the Democratic Party should engage in the fight now. We've already seen voter suppression. Where are the lawsuits? Where is the fight now? Not in the fall. That's going to be too late. There's a new generation of young people that are coming on, and they are being discouraged from voting because of these polling uh, place irregularities. There's a meeting scheduled for April 5th and 6th in Charlotte, North Carolina, led by Attorney Barbara Online, about two or four of the activists around the country on, on, on the subject, which you're talking about. Well, you know, and that brings us to these two gentlemen who joined the panel, um, two of the most esteemed uh, Americans in American politics. And we want to thank you, Attorney Richard Boykin, for being with us. Thank you very much. Glad and, to be here. Oh, thank you. You have worked for Congressman Danny Davis, so you understand Washington and congressional politics, U.S. House of Representative politics. Well, it's for me. <laughs> Everybody volunteers for you, Reverend Jackson. We never stop working for you. And, and the next clerk of the Cook County... That's right. That's right. He's running for office right now. But he has also been on the Cook County Board of Commissioners. Sure. So you really understand county politics and what that means, because we have our friend, of course, Rodney Ellis, a former state senator, who left the state legislature to become the Harris County Commissioner. And his staff has multiplied exponentially. I want you to explain how that works, the importance of county politics, and, of course, Jonathan Swain. Now, where are you from? The Chicago Board of Elections. I am. We love it. <laughs> uh, voting early and often. Just kidding. And Just his kidding. father was a longtime great member of Rainbow Push. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and it's great to see you back in your father's place, man. That's there you right. go. We're there so you go. excited. Glad to be here. And we want you to explain um, county and, I mean, and not just Chicago, but I mean, the politics, everybody's looking at the presidency, mm -hmm. but we're missing everything that's happening down ballot, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So look, let me thank you all for having me on Saturday morning forum. I uh, think that the local elections are just as important as the national elections wow. because oftentimes the primary determines who's going to be the winner in November. So ultimately in a place like Cook County where you have a predominance of Democrats, uh, the primary is really the ball game. And so we want to make sure that we get as many people out to vote as possible. You know, really your vote is your power. And so I would say it like this, that in terms of the county elections, you got the state's attorney's election that's a hot election and a very important election. You got the Supreme Court of Illinois judges. You got the appellate court. You got the circuit court judges. All of these judges play a major role in terms of helping to shape policy as it relates to child support, as it relates to housing, and a number of other things that uh, people bring before our court system. So it's so vitally important that people get out and vote, vote, vote. And these judges are down ballot, so you got to go to the end of the ballot. Obviously, the congressional elections are important. It's important that we make sure uh, that we get out there and vote for these congressional members because they serve as a real check on the White House. So we got to make sure that, uh, that we have that check on the administration uh, in the House. And, of course, we're going to do everything we can to, to get the Senate into Democratic hands as well. What are you Let me ask you, why do you think that the, the right wing came down so often so early on Kim Fox fight? She is hell. Well, I, I think it's because, Reverend, she has been a real, she's had a real focus on criminal justice reform. Look, the county before Kim Fox had been known as a place where John Burge tortured folks into confessions. Uh, when she got into office, she made sure that uh, a number of those individuals who have been tortured into confessions, they got released. 
I mean, they, they, they got exonerated. Their records got cleaned and expunged. Hold so on, she's been moment. a leader in that. Further, would you explain to the national audience just who Kim Fox is? So Kim Fox is running for state's attorney in Cook County for re-election to state's attorney. She's the first African-American woman state's attorney in Cook County. And she's been a leader in terms of criminal justice reform. Uh, there are a number of people uh, coming after her and coming after her job because they don't like the fact that she's done a good job in terms of criminal justice reform in the county. That's why this election is one of the most important elections. This election will actually have uh, consequences for generations to come. And I think we got to get everybody out to vote. And we're seeing the same thing happen, having happened with Marilyn Mosby and in Baltimore, yeah, these progressive prosecutors. Black female state's attorneys. That's correct. All on the tech. Yes. That's, that's something. Yeah. Reverend, you're right. There's seven uh, African-American female state's attorneys across the country, and they're all under attack. What was in Baltimore? Yep. Mm -hmm. so. And it's because they've been righting some of the wrongs of the past. The state's attorney is the, you know, the office where you have the power to prosecute. Uh, and that is an enormous power. And if it's used unwisely, it can have devastating consequences on communities. And when you look at the African-American community, for example, uh, last year in Cook County, 379,000 people were arrested. In, in 246,000 of those 379,000 were African-Americans. In 48,000 cases, the charges were dropped in those cases or the case was dismissed. Now, that's a whole lot of people who have an arrest record. And if you have an arrest record that hasn't been expunged, it simply means that it will hold you back from job opportunities, from housing opportunities, and possibly educational loans for school. Let me ask you, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Swain from the Chicago Board of Elections, why would you want to be on the Board of Elections? What do you do? Well, effectively, we oversee the elections in the city of Chicago, um, voter registration, uh, election administration, and counting the vote. And so <clears throat> I desire to be um, a commissioner on the Board of Elections because I think it's one of the most important roles you can have in government, making sure that elections are free, elections are fair, um, that elections are, are consistently administered, especially in times like today. So the, the, the current pandemic out there of coronavirus is causing um, a, a lot of challenges with this election with respect to polling places that sometimes typically are in nursing homes okay. that have to be moved out for, for health reasons. Um, you have other uh, private uh, polling place locations that are saying, you know, we don't want a mass of people coming into our building. And so we're trying to manage all those things and all those polling places moving around to make sure that the election is fair to everyone. And so you're sitting in this role, you have the opportunity to oversee that and to make sure that uh, everyone has the access that they're, they're entitled to. Well, when you, you know, you, you make so much sense. You should run for something yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend, I appreciate the compliment, but I like doing what I do. <laughs> but you know, in a, in a time like this, this is very unsettling. I've got about a minute left. Mm -hmm. Why don't you speak to people and let them know that it's safe to vote? It, it is. And, and I'm going to speak nationally because we have the election in Illinois on, in, on, uh, on Tuesday. But um, when you have an opportunity, early vote. Okay, as long as you keep wash your hands, as l we're going to keep that the, the polling place is clean with sanitizer and wipes and making sure that the screens are clean. We're going to do all we can to make sure that we're adhering to the protocols that have been given by, uh, by health officials to make sure that the election is, uh, is safe. Um, it, it, it's a difficult time. We understand that. But we realize that uh, uh, this is the time to vote. And so we're going to try to do everything we can to make sure that, that, that uh, people have that opportunity. Attorney Boykin, you got about 20 seconds. Here yours. Look, I want to thank you for your leadership, Reverend Jackson, and thank you for standing up for all of us to have the right to you, vote. You run the phone for us? I'm not here to talk about that, but I'm here to simply say as, thank as you. Not, yes, uh, yes, that, yes. What you run the phone? Clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County. No, what, 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 does, what does the clerk do? So the clerk is responsible for all of the record keeping of the judiciary and so much more like expungements and that sort of thing. We're going to have to have you back and I'm going to have to have you on my radio show and you too. Thank you. Talk about those things. Yes, on WCPT, the nation's largest progressive talk radio station. But I want you to stay right here 
on the Operation Push Saturday Morning Forum of Rainbow Push Coalition. And please like and share on Facebook and stream us live on rainbowpush.org. Back in just a few minutes. Good morning. We are in the midst of a major drive to get more members, more people engaged and involved in Rainbow Push, uh, supporting the programs of Push for Excellence and the Citizenship Education Fund. If you're interested in public policy and you want to help change the policies that impact those incarcerated, change the policies that impact uh, students attending uh, colleges and universities, if you want to be a policymaker, then you need to join Rainbow Push and join by paying your $35 right now. Some of you watch us every week. You, you listen to us on the radio. You're viewing us on social media. We need you to become a member. It's only $35 a year. If you believe in the scholarships that we give to thousands of students each and every year, we've awarded more than $10 million to scholars year to date. What do you have to do to give and support PUSH? It's really very simple. You can go to rainbowpush.org if you're on a computer and press donate. Give any amount, every dollar is important. If you want to talk to somebody, call us at 773-256-2775. You can give right now, any denomination that you uh, choose. You can text the word PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444. Text the word on your cell phone. Most of you have a cell phone. Just text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444, and you can give any amount that you feel comfortable giving or call us 773-256-2775 or go to rainbowpush.org and just press donate. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. Rainbow Push, I think of two words, social justice, education advocacy, political empowerment, freedom and equality, corporate partnership. Stop the violence, save the children. Don't give in, shut it down. If we don't give in, shut it down. Political change, inclusion, evolution, progress, justice. Jesse Jackson. Keep hope, keep hope, alive. alive. Keep hope, keep, keep hope, alive. 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 The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, the expert body on coronavirus, has released guidance for general public and healthcare professionals on the symptoms of the virus. The CDC defined close contact as being within about 6 feet, 1.8 meters, or within the room or care area of a person with the coronavirus for a prolonged period without appropriate protective clothing or having direct contact with the infectious secretions of a person with the virus without protective clothing. Coronaviruses are particularly dangerous for people who have weaker immune systems, like young children and older adults. To protect yourself from the virus, 
try to avoid contact with people who display symptoms similar to those of pneumonia or the common cold, like coughing or a runny nose. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth with unwashed hands. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water and scrub for at least 20 seconds. Use alcohol-based hand sanitizer when possible. Avoid animals and animal markets. The only current treatment for coronavirus being offered is supportive in nature. If you notice any of these symptoms and conditions, please contact your nearest professional healthcare setup. Help spread this information to everyone. Welcome back to the Operation Push Saturday Morning Forum of the Rainbow Push Coalition. Uh, streaming live on Facebook, on the Rainbow Push page and the Reverend Jesse Jackson Senior page and on rainbowpush.org. And of course, with our partner, the Impact Television Network, the largest African-American owned religious network in all of American television. We, of course, joining Reverend Jesse Jackson and uh, our founder and president. Well, yeah, was well, Reverend, we Number have to let everybody know who they are. This off the record, off the wall. Have you heard from Russia since this crisis started? Have you ever heard of Russia? No, not at all. <laughs> They've been quite silent. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Reverend Jesse Jackson, our founder and president, and Jonathan Jackson, our national spokesman. Of course, he was just speaking to Army veterans. Yeah, the, the other point and is, the, uh, it's amazing we have all this mm -hmm. military preparation. A germ is a germ. The whole world has come to explain the power of that germ. Well, and as you explain that, Dr. Damon Arnold, the former uh, department, the uh, former head of the Illinois Department of Public Health, and of course, we have got this beautiful lady, we cannot forget, Rochelle Bellow, St. Bernard's Infectious Disease, Doctor of Nursing Practice, and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, the World Health Organization has determined this week that this is now a pandemic. The president, as we just, has declared this, a national emergency. What is the coronavirus, COVID-19? What what's a pandemic and what's a national emergency? What's the big deal? Well, a pandemic is something where you have the distribution of the virus or a disease state throughout the world, so it's global. And right now we have six continents involved. Uh, Antarctica is not one of them, so that's the seventh continent that seem, does not seem to be affected at this point. But it is a virus that is called coronavirus, and corona, this means crown. So if you looked at it under a microscope, the particle itself, the viral particle, looks like it has spikes on it. And so it looks sort of like a crown picture if you were to look at it. And what coronavirus is, is uh, most of the coronaviruses, they cause approximately 25% of uh, common colds. So we have had coronaviruses in the environment for uh, centuries, essentially. And uh, what COVID is, is coronavirus disease. And it was found in 2019. So that's where they get the COVID-19. What makes it so deadly? Uh, what makes it so deadly is this virus actually goes into the lungs and it can actually attach to what we call um, ACE receptors or angiotensin converting enzyme receptors that are on the surfaces of the cells of our lungs. It attaches there and it goes out to the periphery of the lungs, usually in the lower lung fields and on, on the outside. That can actually cause a pneumonia mm. because your body reacts to it. It's a foreign substance that your body seems to uh, not want to be around. That foreign substance can start up a reaction. It can cause scarring in the lungs and those kinds of things. However, most, about 80% of the people who get the coronavirus, which is uh, actually called SARS-CoV-2, so it's uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, coronavirus 2. And the reason why SARS is so important to, uh, to, to mention is because that's the actual virus that you get. The actual disease is COVID-19. I want to ask a question to the nurse because yes. mm -hmm. the nurse on the front line of this war. Mm -hmm. What about your health? Mm -hmm. Exactly right. It's so important with this COVID-19 mm -hmm. because of the unknown. It's really critical that we create processes to protect our, not only our nurses, but 
the CNAs, everybody is so important. It's really a bigger picture than everyone knows. So this is why it's really hard as an infectious disease and in making sure that we have processes in place to mitigate the potential risk of COVID ID being transmitted to our headline staff, because if they're sick, what happens? We can't take care of our public population. Well, National Nurses United, yes. they have formally complained about yes. the absence of protocols. Well, um, I mean, and it's so uneven from hospital to hospital all across the country. What's happening with our nurses? Just tell us, give us some background on what their complaints are about, because they also said, you know, with, with respect to a vaccine that we might get, uh, you're supportive of it being available to everyone, and there's pushback on that. Well, I think the first thing is the shortage of nurses. Right now, it's such a shortage of nurses, and with the COVID ID, you really want one nurse to one patient ratio, and that's really difficult when you're already short staff. So realistically, to combat this disease, we have to onboard more nurses, mm -hmm. making them available for those patients that we have. And I only see this getting worse. I mean, wouldn't you agree, Doctor? It's yes. only going to get worse before it gets better. So will we have the manpower to mitigate the risk in the hospital? Well, the problem, problem is the health problem with lack of a priority. I want to ask John another question if it fits in. Uh, we look now and president has emergency, safe emergency. Mm -hmm. yes. 50 billion what, what was the announcement that John, 50 billion on that to, today? Um, well, the president has made a lot of big numbers. He said through a uh, credit program with the SBA, they were going to extend $50 billion additionally, additionally in credit. Um, Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, said that they were going to uh, put $1.5 trillion into the repo market, which is a repurchase agreement for securities with the major banks in the event they have a liquidity crisis, an issue because so many banks, so many businesses are now contracting and therefore they're going to lean on their credit line because their cash flow is going to to be severely coming to a halt. As you see in the airline industry, you still have to make your uh, payments on your planes and everything, even if nobody's flying. Even if they don't take off, you still have a huge capital investment that you have to pay money on. So there are factories and mortgages and businesses that are gonna have to rely on their credit I lines. I it back to the health because priorities determine yeah, okay. who's in front and who's in the back. I agree with your yes, priorities, yes. and this mm -hmm. is definitely an emerging priority. So we definitely need our government officials to realize this is an emerging priority. And we need candidates in the House that's going to support us, nurses, and the health care itself. One-to-one yes. -one ratio, please explain. Mm -hmm. What would that mean, and why is that important, particularly with respect to the coronavirus? With respect to the coronavirus, one-to-one -one ratio, because that nurse should only care for that patient because we don't want to risk her <laughs> transmitting the virus to the next patient. No one would think about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's really crucial that you have the one-to-one -one because we want to limit <clears throat> the risk of transmitting it to the next patient. Cynthia, the influence on the NBA. Yes. NCAA tournament, all that. Soccer, NHL. And then some all. black churches determined to, put, to, to, to confront the disease. Vulnerable populations is coming Sunday. Many of our members are older, number one, They're in, the, in, in the zone. But faith should not confront science. Faith should put science in perspective. This is too real to even run the risk of, in the name of God, dying prematurely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, Reverend, that's a, that's a very important point. Um, you know, I, when pa patients ask me, you know, uh, sh should I pray? I always tell them, you should. And, I, and they say, well, you know, you're here. And I said, well, uh, don't you think that God may have put me here to help you? <laughs> that the, the inspiration that's coming through me as a person who's providing care may be coming from God that's saying that you need this person here for you. Mm. So we, we need to pay attention to the people who have uh, the knowledge in the background to make these decisions. And what I've been seeing so far from uh, the uh, leadership in the country is uh, really a poor response 
to the health care needs of this country? John, but the politics of health care is, is costly. It costs more not to have it than to have it. Is burn the center street of, of, of affordable health care. Thirty-two billion over ten years. President Forbes, it's reported to be on the same system. There's not a couple of people, John. Well, and I think the um, main thing that's been taken out of uh, out of proportion, and there's a misunderstanding on what uh, Senator Sanders can do as president as it relates to health care, that there are 70 million Americans that are covered through the Medicare system. And uh, although they may be 70 and 80, they still can have an organ transplant. And many of those persons have money. They can afford an organ transplant, but they let the government pay for it. Senator Sanders, I believe, is demonstrating he has the integrity to fight for the same health care access he has as a United States senator as he would want for all of his constituents. That's a big deal. Senator, since you own the airline, tell them all this research going into finding this solution. What Democratic Social doesn't look like. This is what Democratic Social doesn't look like. Well, this is what the FDR plan looks like. This is this is really the fulfillment of the Four Freedoms. This is really the fulfillment of the New Deal. This is really about making America more just and fair. Of course, his successor, FDR's successor, uh, tried to get us a universal single payer program in the 40s. So this is this is not new. Healthcare is something that we have been fighting about and fighting for for decades, and now I think it's come upon us as we look at this worldwide pandemic. In the last, well, well, uh, let me minutes, put one other point there. I think people have to take two steps back and first ask: Is the system working? Is it just? Is it fair? Is it okay? And the question becomes: Like, why are we? even operating this system. This only came about in 1972-3 when Nixon was able to let uh, Kaiser Permanente go into for-profit health care. By definition, if you have for-profit care for person's health, a rich life is worth more than a poor life. Now, if you're rich and you can afford all the private doctors you want, an open and free market will let you do that. But if you're poor, you still have uh, access to an angioplasty, a, a CAT scan, that your life expectancy should not be determined solely on your zip code. And your predictor of success anywhere in this country has more to do with the zip code that you're born into than it is your talent and your aptitude. The two communities were live in 93 and 60 within eight miles in Chicago. Chicago has the greatest life expectancy discrepancy uh, of any major city from the in the rush uh, uh, between Northwestern Hospital and the uh, and the Gold Coast and Inglewood, 30 years within eight miles uh, in the same city, let alone within the same country. Uh, what would the health care mean? Right. It means the Obamacare did a great thing in opening the discussion and getting legislation passed to let the government intervene. Now it needs to be expanded. That's another word of saying Medicare for all, uh, to expand the current system that there are 28 million people that are that are not in the system, meaning they either couldn't afford the insurance or don't want it, separate issues. And the second part is those, another 58 million that have not met their deductibles. For example, if you want to go get a coronavirus test and you have insurance, they may charge you $3,000. 1,000 out of your deductible, $2,000 charging to your insurance. Who says they should be making a profit to test citizens uh, for their well-being to stop a contagious, communicable disease. So we have to look at taking the cost down. That's what Medicare, so it's not 10 trillion, 30, 30 trillion. You need to see how these hospitals are raping the federal government by these enormous costs. Cuba has a longer life expectancy than the United States of America, uh, and they're at one-tenth of our cost. What is it that we can learn about cost containment and bringing down the cost? If that means uh, re releasing all the debt from medical doctors to encouraging children to go to medical school to paying for those in, in nursing school, we can bring down the cost side. It doesn't have to be 
this high. And in Cuba, they have a doctor on every block. Something to be said for that. You know what? I wish we had more time to talk with you, but to Dr. Damon Arnold, mm -hmm. former Dep Department of Illinois Public Health Director, we're so glad that you're always with us. And, and Veteran, we just thank you for the service that you have rendered to our country, to all of us throughout the world for so many years. Uh, Nurse Bello, Rochelle Bello, we just thank you for being on the front lines of health care because, indeed, you're the first and last person we always see when we're sick, and we thank God for you. Uh, of course, Jonathan Jackson, thank you for your service as a national spokesman for Rainbow Push. And Reverend Jesse Jackson, I've got about 20 seconds. They belong to you. Long time, these men. There are roughly a, a, a million hospital beds in the United States of America, and in any given night, there's almost 800,000 that are being occupied. If we just have 2% of our nation's population infected with this disease, you have 6 million people that are exposed. We do not have the capacity, the infrastructure, the safety net to even uh, care for our citizens. Hey, everybody, I was just trying to get out of here. RainbowBush.org, everybody. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you for tuning in to our International Saturday Morning Broadcast. We need your support. Here are ways to give to Rainbow Push Coalition. Text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to pound 41444 to support the work of Rev. Jesse Jackson Sr. and Rainbow Push Coalition. When you shop, Amazon gives. Visit Amazon Smile and select PUSH for excellence as your charitable organization by starting your shopping at smile.amazon.com. Get involved with the movement. Join the movement. If you're not a member, become a member. I am somebody. Fighting the most important battles for freedom and justice for all. You made us change.